This is Chattanooga Civics. I'm Nathan Bird. The city of Chattanooga is getting ready to vote for a new mayor and city council. Early voting will begin February 10th and end on February 25th. The deadline to request an absentee ballot is February 23rd. Election day is March 2nd. Please visit the Hamilton County Election Commission website for more details. And let's get started. I am here with Tim Gorman. He is running for city council in District 2. And Tim, if you could just tell me a little bit about yourself, tell the listeners who you are and uh, a little bit about your district as well. Sure, sure. So uh, to begin with, I'm Tim Gorman and I've moved to Chattanooga about 24 years ago. And basically, Allison and I have raised our three daughters here. We have fallen in love with the city. There is so much to offer here. I moved here because I relocated to take a job up in Cleveland, Tennessee, but I chose to actually do a reverse commute. And uh, so going the opposite way of traffic is a lot easier. But I've worked in that factory uh, with some of the same people for the last 24 years. And I've been in technical management uh, for 25 years. And I relocated from Memphis as a manager. And as that, I've been with these same people, a lot of the same people I've stayed with for the last 24 years at this plant. I've hired a lot of people in those years, and I really enjoy working with people and doing a lot with people. So uh, one of the things about people, if you got a moment, um, about four years ago, my company decided they were going to divest a plant in Quebec, uh, in Montreal City, Quebec. And so the only two things I can say in French is my name is Tim and where's the bathroom. And I was asked to go up to uh, divest that plant. So the company was bare as in bare aspirin at the time. They had over a hundred thousand employees worldwide. And they chose me not because of my French expertise, nor because of my technical expertise, but because I could get people through a difficult change. So they divested this plant. I went up there and ran it for the last six months before it converted over to a new company. And we basically got all of our production out. We met all of our compliance and regulatory commitments. No one got injured and everyone retained their job on the other side. So it was a very successful thing. But I think that's an example of how I, I work well with folks. I've also had to build collaboration uh, in my group. I also have to work outside of my site with marketing, R&D, finance to launch new products. And as such, these are all peers, but they're elsewhere in the United States or even internationally. And dealing with them, we have to consent to come to consensus. And so my collaboration skills, I think, are going to be key as the city council takes seat in April, because at that point, you've got seven contested uh, seats, plus you're going to have a new mayor. So if we're not working in a collaborative way, we're going to lose a lot of key time up front. Mm -hmm. So to tell you a little about District 2, and District 2 runs from North Market Street all the way up to 153 from the river to Red Bank. And there's just a little wedge uh, where Access Road is, where DuPont is, that's not in that district. So it's a very diverse district. I mean, you know, you've got areas that have got multi-million dollar houses and you've got areas that have, you know, much less, we'll say. Um, but it's a lot of neat little neighborhoods. I've been doing a lot of canvassing, been talking to a lot of folks and um, you know, you got Lupton City, which is an old mill town. You get up to Galaxy Heights, and that was a, built during the uh, whole space race. So you got Milky Way and Comet Trail, things like that. Um, so it it's a neat area, but much like Chattanooga, it's very diverse uh, economically, I will say at mm -hmm. least. Um, so I think that mirrors what are their concerns in a lot of cases are going to be the concerns overall for Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. um, and so the key things that I want to focus on is, is my motto is taking care of people, taking care of neighborhoods, taking care of each other. So taking care of people initially is going to be a response to COVID because hopefully when we're seated in April, we'll be on the downside of this pandemic mm -hmm. and we can start helping um, move some federally funded money into the right hands to help both families and small businesses get folks back working again and get our economy moving again. Um, that's short term. Longer term, I deal with strategic plans at my factory, five, 10, 15 year plans. 
And if you get a 15 year plan, you may not be doing spending right now, but you might be in five years to make sure you get to that ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. And so for me, one of the key things is to break the cycle of poverty, you really have got to invest in education. And the schools are managed by the county, but that doesn't mean that we're not responsible for anything. So one of the key things I think we need to continue working on is early childhood education. And so that looks at early Head Start and Head Start programs. And that's because a child's brain chemistry is, is, is formed by the time they're three. And by the time they're four or five, they've learned how they're going to learn. So those are key to make them successful. And if we can get that well instituted and get that first wave through and stay the course, and that's a tough thing because it's not a quick fix, but you can wait to 15 years and you start getting these as young adults, you're going to see higher graduation rates. You're going to see better skills in our folks, which are going to yield higher paying jobs. Mm -hmm. You're going to have lower incarceration. Um, you're going to have more people contributing back to the economy. And ultimately the city is going to have a bigger tax revenue. And so it's a win-win. Uh, it just, it's a painfully slow process, right. but because it's slow, doesn't mean you shouldn't start on it today. And that's, mm -hmm. So that's just taking care of people. My other ones will be a little quicker, I promise. But the, the next is um, taking care of neighborhoods. So this district is a, uh, it's almost like a little history of the 20th century in Chattanooga. So you've got mm -hmm. the North Shore, which is the very early 1900s. And then by the time you get to Lupton City, that was a, a great mill city. That was the original work play live city concept back in the 20s. They had their own swimming pool. Mm -hmm. um, they had their own doctor local. And then, like I said, you move up to Galaxy Heights and, and you're into the 50s and 60s at that point. So all these neighborhoods have great character. And you know, from a development standpoint, this district is already pretty well developed. So everything going on at this point is now just infill. And so I have no issue with infilling, but let's match the neighborhood. You don't the reason you move to a neighborhood is because you like the surroundings. I mean, you don't want to move into a neighborhood and just build a house that does not fit because it ruins it for everyone else. And ultimately what you built, what you moved there for is going to be lost. So I would like to make sure that we can work with developers and maintain the, the have developers working to enhance neighborhoods, but mm -hmm. also maintain the character of the neighborhood. Then lastly, taking care of each other. And this is, uh, you know, we want to do things that build community and community builds great neighborhoods and great neighborhoods build a vibrant city with a, with a, with a sustainable economy. And what I see is we need to do things where people can get out and share with each other. Anytime you can sit and talk with a neighbor and share ideas, everyone's going to learn. So I'm looking at sidewalks, bikeways, pocket parks. I mean, we've got a lot of neighborhoods that have no meeting place. It might be like a church parking lot is all that they've got available for them. So those are some of the things to put in neighborhoods that don't have them. But then conversely, where we do have infrastructure, let's maintain it. So, you know, everyone's been talking about the potholes in the streets, uh, buckled sidewalks. But even you know, as you get into downtown, we've done a lot of things to really fix up the downtown and it's just falling apart. So like the people mover on Second Street, you know, that was scuttled after two years. And, and so there's, was that money well spent? Maybe not, but the, the fact is, if we're going to do something, let's maintain it. Let's keep it in good shape. So that's kind of my overall focus, my overall mission. And that's a little bit about district two. Great. So I, I want to dive in in a little more detail to some of these things that you mentioned. I'll start with COVID. Um, you know, like you said, hopefully by the time the new city council takes their seats in April, we'll be on the downswing, the vaccine will start kicking in and the disease itself won't be as much of an issue. Uh, but there is a lot of economic impact on the horizon in terms of struggling small businesses, people struggling to pay their rent, people losing their jobs or having their hours cut. And so I'm just wondering, kind of dive into your the particulars of your, of your plan on how to, you know, how can the city council help us get through those economic impacts on the other side of COVID? Sure. And I, I think, and, and I'm not a big government person, but I do feel in a case like this where it's a short time, one-off situation, mm -hmm. manning a task force and having them, that's their focus for COVID. But once it's done, we take a lessons learned from it and they dismantle. 
So, I mean, the key thing is we've got to get money and services to the, to the people that need it. And if you go down to chattanooga.gov, we've got a lot of great existing agencies and services, but there's almost so much it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And to almost have like an ombudsman that could kind of take a look and say, okay, you need help with rent, you need help here, and direct you to the right people. Um, in a lot of cases, there's already nonprofits that are dealing with helping with utility bills or helping mm -hmm. with rent. And so the focus is let's get where we can get federal and or state funding, get it to those to go ahead, those groups to already disperse the money because they're already set up doing that. They know what to do. Right. So I want to take advantage of any existing resources that we have and basically have a coordinator working with them to make sure that we can help the folks out. Right. And then I, I want to move on and talk about um, you mentioned infill development and how that's an issue in your district and also, you know, associated issues with transportation and parks and things like that. And this is something that, that I see as kind of the, honestly, one of the core competencies of the city council, because the city council is in charge of the zoning code and all of the development regulations. And it's something I hear a lot about from people, um, not necessarily zoning in particular, because that gets pretty into the weeds, but people are worried about water quality, about uh, sensitive landscapes like steep slopes. They're worried about the, um, the consent decree for our sewer system right. and and just making sure that we're you know keeping tabs on developers and making sure that what is being built is going to last and that it's not going to negatively impact the city and on on the flip side of that you know we do need more housing in a lot of cases there are people you know bringing that up that that supply is not necessarily keeping up with demand and a lot of people point to these regulations as as part of the reason for that so I'm wondering if you could dive into more detail about how exactly you're going to regulate that infill development, uh, what kind of ideas you might have, especially as it relates to things that the city council already does like zoning and development regulations. Sure, so the, my biggest concern with zoning is, is we walk our dogs quite a bit and we walk through the neighborhoods and you, the first thing you always see is a zoning variance. And the fact is, if you're gonna make rules to follow, follow the rules, but if everything is a one-off, you know, this, this developer gets a variance for this, this developer gets a variance for something else. And so it's almost a mishmash of it's, it's nothing really enforceable because everyone knows that if they get permission up front, they can move ahead. Um, the developers, to me, almost they're driving the business rather than the city saying, look, we need some housing that's affordable. You tell us what would work. And when we talk about affordable housing, you know, first of all, affordable housing doesn't have to be 2,400 square foot house. It can be apartments. It can be mm -hmm. a thousand square foot house. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be something that someone can afford and they're safe and it protects them. And, and so I think what's happening is we've got a lot of money coming, you know, because of our, our reputation, we've got a lot of people moving into this town and the focus tends to be more on the high-end developments. And a lot of people wanna be, we'll say in the North shore area, there's, there's several key areas that people uh, down off Main Street now, South Side. And so those areas are booming. And what's happening is you're not really building affordable housing there. And any housing that was in that area, now because you're throwing up, uh, Hill City is an example, they're throwing up bigger houses in Hill City and people that are living in the smaller houses can't afford the taxes because all of a sudden their property value is going up. And, you know, it's, gen it's the bad side of gentrification. The people that originally lived there are going to be forced out. So I think the key thing is rather than letting the developers drive the conversation, the city needs to drive the conversation. They say, this is what we need. What can you do to meet this and work that way rather than let a developer come in and say, let me tell you what I'm going to do. And then, oh, I need a variance for this and a variance for that. That's not the way to do business. Mm -hmm. And then you also mentioned transportation, especially um, with regards to cycling, walking, the sidewalks being buckled here and there and things like yeah. that, making it difficult for people to get around if you don't have a car. Uh, I'd like you to talk more on that, on your plans for transportation. And you also mentioned, you know, infill parks and things like that. Um, you know, what, what do you think the city council can do to better make sure that our city is well connected and that people can get around regardless of what mode of transportation they're using. Sure. And I think, you know, one thing is as a classic city of this age, um, the car ruled Chattanooga. 
Chattanooga was designed for, you know, commuting about in a car. And so there are spots. I mean, once again, when you get downtown, when you get in the North Shore, where it's a little easier to walk and ride bikes. Um, so, you know, one thing talking to folks in, in basically Lupton City and Fairfax Heights, um, Stewart Heights, folks along Eli, um, they feel very unsafe walking because there's there's in a lot of cases it's just a, a, a deep ditch on each side of the road so if a car right. comes along so we need to figure out some way how to if, if nothing else build a sidewalk on one side of the road or build a small walking area or at least putting a curb on the side of the road so if they're walking in the shoulder there's some protection much like a protected bike lane so that's the first step and once again this is going to be a tough tax year for the city because we're based on tourism. And, and right. so a lot of these things, this, this comes back to that whole strategic plan. You got to lay out, when are we going to do this? What's it going to cost us and start working towards that. The, uh, as far as like buses, I, I was reading on the West coast that they were looking at a couple cities have gone to fare free um, buses. And what that does is that all, all of a sudden, you know, at first people are a little hesitant, but all of a sudden, it, um, after a year, it increased ridership, which all of a sudden takes cars off the road. So you've got less traffic working that way, which helps out. But um, and, and so Chattanooga already has, they have that little electric shuttle that runs up and down uh, Market Street and, and comes mm -hmm. back down Broad. And the fact is, if they could expand that, because uh, there are people that rely, that don't have cars, rely on a bus to get to places. And they're not living in downtown Chattanooga. They're living a lot further out, um, Alton Park, something like that. So if we could run a shuttle, you know, to Alton Park, maybe once every hour and pick folks up and at least get them back town, town where they can catch a different bus. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that can be done there. Once again, it's got to be prioritized, but I think that would be a, a good move. There's a lot of people that are working downtown with limited budgets mm -hmm. and no car. And I think something like that would help put more money in their pocket, which would then help them contribute back to the economy in other other areas. Right. And then um, one thing that's kind of related to all this is, is homelessness. Um, you know, it's kind of downstream of all these issues of affordable housing and COVID relief and, and all these things where if you miss these steps, then suddenly you end up, people are on the streets right. and don't know where to go. So, you know, what do you think the city council can do to better manage homelessness in this city? And what direction do you think we should take that? Well, um, a couple of years back, Mayor Burke did the, um, his goal was to have zero homeless vets on the street. Mm -hmm. And he basically, that was a focused approach. And that's, uh, I would like to use that as a model and kind of keep working on that. But then to your point, again, we've got services. We just need to get proper funding and get those services to the right nonprofits to help right. folks uh, with rent payments, with utility payments, things like that. But then Conversely, it's twofold. You want to keep people off the streets up front. And then once they're on the streets, what can we do to help? And once again, you know, I know that uh, the city council basically released more money uh, during COVID to help more folks who were homeless. So mm -hmm. there's one, there's more funding that we should be able to do to help those that need help. And then speaking of funding, that's a good, good segue into some of my next questions. I want to talk you know, several questions kind of revolving around the budget and the budgeting process. Uh, right now, the mayor is in charge of leading that budgeting process. They're in charge of setting up the community input. They're in charge of writing the budget and handing it to the city council for them to vote on. And, you know, in the current form, this process involves more than six months of preparation. Uh, we started in like November for a budget that's gonna be presented in June. And it seems like, so the city council has the authority to amend or even reject the budget, but it seems like in the past, the city has been reluctant to kind of use that power and, and has deferred to the process that's in place. And there's a lot of good arguments on both sides, whether or not the city council should defer to that process since it's, you know, it's so long and arduous, or, you know, since they have more input from the community, maybe the city council should take a, a seat further, closer to the front. So I'm wondering, where do you stand on that? How do you think the city council can better manage the budget? And do you think the city council should be more involved in that? Okay, so first, definitely, I feel the city council should be more involved. It's, um, I think we need the community involved. And I know that when the mayor pulls that together, he does get representatives from the community, but I don't know 
if that is a full representation of all nine council seats, you know, for representatives. But that's, mm -hmm. I feel once again, that, you know, 10 people working on something is better than one focused on it. The, the other key thing is transparency. I, I think we need the city council more involved with it up front so they know what's going on. So I took a look at, at the last budget presented last year, 740 something pages, and it's presented in about 30 slides. And you don't, you know, if you go approve that, I mean, first of all, you're not going to be reading 740 pages at the last two weeks. I mean, mm -hmm. you need to be involved with the development of that as it goes along. So you know where the money's going, what it's been spent on historically, because what it seems like is once the money is locked, it gets into different departments and that's their money. And if another department needs money and these, you know, you spend your money and I'm sorry, you can't have any. So we need some flexibility to move the money where it's needed because things happen during the year where mm -hmm. things change and we need to be able to shift money as needed. And then, you know, a lot of people's first real interest in the budget, you know, at least people of my age has been this summer around the protests that happened, the Black Lives Matter protests, where we had over 200 people come to a city council meeting to express their opinion on the fact that some seven, $70 million out of a roughly $240 million budget is going to the police department. And there's a lot of different ways people can, can take this question, but it, essentially what I'm trying to drive at is, um, how do you think we can improve our police? You know, there's all sorts of different ideas out there, some of which are directly contradictory, so you can't make everybody happy. So I'm wondering what direction do you think we should take that? How can we improve our police and make sure that all Chattanoogans feel safe? Okay, so I think the first thing, I mean, and, and the concern is always about um, the wrong actions by a police officer, you know, escalating something that didn't need to be escalated possibly. So I think having uh, social workers, crisis management people um, as a first line for nonviolent you know, calls, have them there, mental health experts. And once again, this, this costs money, but uh, it, it's been done in other places. And it's and actually the police find it reassuring because it takes a burden off of them that they don't have to manage some of these crisis things. So I think that's a good first step. Secondly, I think that it, it's twofold. I think we need to be able to offer our, our officers more money because that gives us the ability to recruit the best, but then also we should have higher expectations. And so uh, to me, you know, that's a spend money, but I think it's an investment in the right direction. Um, the other key thing I think we really need to work on is we need more diversity in the police force. Uh, and this is actually, in, we'll say on the beat level because you want the police officers to reflect the neighborhoods they're walking through. Right. And um, I think that more than anything will really calm a lot of nerves. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So I wanna move on and shift gears a little bit and talk about Chattanooga's kind of growing reputation as an outdoor destination. Sure. We've been named number one city twice now by Outdoor Magazine for the outdoors. And that brings with it a lot of benefits and also a lot of challenges. You know, we have the benefits of increased tourism and increased interest in the city, but also a lot of new growth that we then have to manage. And also a history of some communities who have not been connected to those outdoor resources historically. So I'm wondering what, what do you think the city council can do to take advantage of this new reputation and to make sure it's managed properly and it doesn't kind of spin out of control? Okay, so I think one of the things is, I mean, we've got a great tourism economy, and, and I would like to allocate some of that hotel tax um, piece for people coming to visit and set that aside for folks that live in areas where they're not going to get to enjoy some of the outdoor things. And this, again, comes back to, it doesn't have to be elaborate, we could actually make some nice parks in some of the more downtrodden areas just for a chance for people to escape the humdrum of the city, just to go in amongst some trees, some nice landscaped areas. So I think there's some benefit there. I also think, um, you know, there's a lot of neat things that Chattanooga has done in the past between, and this is not city, this is you know, more of the private sector, but riverfront nights, nightfall, um, you've got the, the sculpture garden over at Montague Park. So there's things that we can do for people 
but once again, a lot of that's all based downtown. And I would like to see some of that divest throughout the city so that everyone's got an equal opportunity to enjoy some of the, the things the city has to offer. But I would like to fund those things out of our hotel taxes, which is coming from people coming to visit the city. Right, right. And then let's see where I lost my spot here, sorry. So I've got another question kind of shifting gears again. Chattanooga government still has a bit of a reputation as kind of a good old boys club. You know, people feel like they're not involved in the decision making process of the city. Uh, sometimes they feel like they're not being heard or, or even if they're being heard, they're not actually being taken into account. So what are your thoughts on how the city council can make sure that all Chattanoogans feel like they're being represented properly and that their voices are being heard? Okay, well, and I think I'm, I'm actually hoping we're moving away from that right now. So if you look at the mm -hmm. current city council, you have four people of color and you have two females. So mm -hmm. we're kind of breaking that stereotype right. of yep. old white guys running everything. So I, I would like to see that continue on um, to further represent the city. But the, it, the other aspect is, it's not necessarily, it's the good old boys, but it's all the networking. And so, um, you know, when we moved here, and I'd be talking to people and say, people go, where'd you go to school? Because they're trying to network. Did I go to high school, the same high school as they did earlier, something mm -hmm. like that. So um, this, I've lived in Memphis, I've lived in Nashville, I've lived uh, in Eastern North Carolina, and I've never seen a city as networked as Chattanooga. I mean, everyone mm -hmm. seems to know everyone and it, it's just very interesting. So to me, people have great networks or they're building great networks, but it's, it's sometimes good to have some fresh eyes come in with some new views. And um, that is something I think that I can offer. But I also take a look at a lot of the other candidates running in other districts. And I'm seeing very progressive ideas coming out and it's some new ideas. And I think depending on how the election goes in, in March, we could have a really exciting city council with some, some new blood and some new ideas. Right. So that's all the particular questions I have. I want to make sure this podcast is supposed to be kind of a sounding board for all of the candidates, you know, a, a chance for you to talk directly to the voters. So I just want to make sure that there's no issues that we haven't covered that you'd like to take some time to speak a little bit more on. Uh, maybe just go in a little more detail. I mean, we talked about a lot of things today and, mm -hmm. you know, it's it as everything in life, it comes down to funding. And, mm -hmm. and this is going to be a tough year on funding. And there's going to be some tough decisions. And, and that's where the city council needs to actually kind of sit down and say, where do we want to be when we're not in office anymore? Where do we want to be in 10 years, 15 years? And how are we going to get there? Mm -hmm. And then start prioritizing actions and funding. So to me, I'm a firm believer as an engineer, you build everything once. You don't sit there and go back and patch it and patch it. And so... I mean, don't say I don't want to rush it, but I, it needs thoughtful consideration that we really have got to figure out what it's going to take to move the city forward. And, and to me, the key thing is, is the education piece, because I think once you get the skilled employees, there's going to be more jobs here. Um, but that's going to be the key driver is, is we've got to work on, on education mm -hmm. at the front end and even at the tail end, um, the future readiness institutes, because not everyone needs to go to college. I mean, if you're looking right now, for someone to do plumbing or sheetrock, you're not gonna find many folks in their 20s or 30s. These are old seasoned folks and that know what mm -hmm. they're doing. And that is something that we are gonna lose here probably the next 10 to 15 years. So we need, we need people with, with key skills to get us there. Um, so to me, Chattanooga is a fantastic city as I made, made mentioned earlier. It's got a fantastic brand name to himself. But unfortunately, we got that brand name because we left a lot of people behind. Um, poverty level is over 30% in the city, and we've got to do we've got to do something to help elevate all 184,000 people and move forward as one. And mm -hmm. that isn't a quick fix, and it's not exciting. It's not like you know something brand new down on the riverfront. It's slow and methodical, and so that's what we, as a city council and a mayor need to work on, not for just the next four years, but I'd say for the next 15 years. Right. So, and then lastly on me, I've never had a political office before. Um, I'm not looking at making a political career. I've 
as you could probably surmise from my my time in industry, I've had a career. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm just deciding. I've after looking at last year, I've had enough. I can't make changes on a national or state level, but I'll try my damnedest here in Chattanooga. Yep. Well, very good. Where can voters find out more about you? They can go to votegorman.com. And uh, same for my social media on Instagram and, and Facebook. So that, that's where you need to go. And um, just a reminder, early voting starts on Tuesday and the election right. is on March 2nd. Yep. So let's make Everybody a change for the better. Yep. Exactly. Well, Tim Gorman running for District 2, thank you for your time and good luck in March. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Take care. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Chattanooga Civics. Our music was written and recorded by Kevin McLeod. If you have any questions or feedback, please send me an email at chattanoogacivics at gmail.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at chatcivics, or visit the website chattanoogacivics.com. Thanks for listening.